Oh, Holy Spirit, be with us as we start exploring the Bible's grand bookends. This inclusio that takes all the threads from the beginning of the Bible and ties them up in Revelation, giving us this ending that is out of this world. Amen. G'day. Last time, we discussed how the Bible has this cool literary device called an inclusio, where the ending mirrors the beginning of the story to show that it is a complete story. And now finally, we get to see how God's grand bookends work as we begin to unpack the inclusio that is Genesis 1 to 3 and Revelation 20 to 22, giving us something to look forward to when we'll be able to witness da, 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 the plan's grand finale, reversing the consequences. And so we will begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as we know, or if you don't, now you will, from the moment God gave the plan in Genesis 3, the rest of the Old Testament narrates what happened as some people lived their lives rejecting God's ways on the basis of doing what is good for me alongside other people who were living for God, who were eagerly looking forward to that day when God's plan would become a reality. Isaiah says it very well with, On that day it will be said, Look, this is our God. We have waited for him. He has saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Then, after all that waiting, reality hit. And it wasn't quite what they expected. The Messiah, the Saviour, came as a normal human, Jesus, dying on a cross, rising from the dead on the third day. And then his ascension back to heaven. But... This was all legit, a part and parcel of God's plan to rescue people from their defiance towards God by deciding what is good for them and disobeying him. Do we believe Jesus came to set things right? Do we believe he came to fulfill the plan set out in Genesis to rescue people who were disobedient, setting themselves up as knowing better than God? Although I am hoping that you already know that Jesus fulfilled the plan because he was the polar opposite to Adam and Eve. And strangely enough, because he was the word right from the very beginning, he really did know what God's word said. And because Jesus totally and completely obeyed God, by completely submitting to God's will. In other words, God's ability to know what's good for you, even when it looks really horrible. Jesus let God rule in his heart by dying a cruel death on the cross, thereby giving everybody who believes in him hope for a future where those who believe will no longer have to suffer the pain of sin and death. Before we begin to look at the inclusio, I think it's worthwhile for us to take a quick look at the Apostle Paul's brilliant Reader's Digest version of Genesis 3, showing how Christ is the answer to God's plan. You know how through Adam... Sin entered the world, and therefore death came to all people. But now, because of Christ's righteousness, in obeying God, all people will have a new life, living in a right relationship with God. Paul is clearly telling the Roman Christians that despite Adam and Eve's 
actions ruining God's good world and how one of the consequences was death coming into the world. But as we've also seen, God offered forgiveness amongst all this mess by promising them he has a plan to end all plans that will ultimately save the day. Paul is reminding the Romans that they know it is Christ who is the fulfillment of the plan. Jesus is God's solution for our sin and how through him we can have a new life living in a right relationship with God right now. Of course, it is strongly possible that you already know, like the New Testament authors did, how thanks to Christ we are living in the time of now and not yet. Yes, we are living in the time of now because we are living knowing Christ is God's Son, the promised Messiah, how Christ is the answer to our sin problem. Yet paradoxically, at the same time, we see the New Testament authors saying, but wait, there is more. As Paul explains... I have kept the faith. And when our Lord Jesus, the righteous judge, returns, there is a prize, the crown of righteousness, which is reserved for everyone who has been eagerly looking forward to his return. And so we are also living in the time of not yet. And in the final three chapters of Revelation, we are given a tiny glimpse of what it will be like when Jesus returns, when we get to see the spectacular grand finale of the plan. So for the rest of today's message, and over the next few weeks, we are going to be looking at how the last three chapters of Revelation, when compared to the first three chapters of Genesis, provide the inclusio to the Bible by giving us this grand bookends showcasing God's plan. Now, as we have discussed, the main themes in Genesis chapters 1 to 3, a few times, I'm not going to repeat them again now, you should know them, but believe me, you will discover and find those same themes are in reverse order in the last three chapters of Revelation. Now, remember how an inclusio is a mirror image and a mirror reverses your image? Therefore, what happens at the end of chapter 3 in Genesis should be seen at the beginning of chapter 20 in Revelation. Yes, I know we haven't looked at what happened after God gave Adam and Eve their consequences, mainly because I, well, maybe wrongly, assume that you all know Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Ah, but do you know exactly how Genesis 3 finishes? Hmm, let's have a look. God drove them out to work the ground from which Adam was taken. And the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim who used the flaming, whirling sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Now hopefully you remember the context for them getting the boot. How when they succumbed to the serpent's temptation by removing God from his rightful place in their hearts and deciding they know better than God what's good for them and how thanks to their actions God had to get tough because you see if they decided it would be good for them to sneak back into the garden and eat from the tree of life, it would mean they would live forever in misery because they would be thinking they were making good choices when in reality they would be making really bad choices. God is making sure there's no way Adam and Eve will ever be able to sneak back in and grab fruit from the tree of life because that would mean they would be living a totally miserable, 
horribly awful life forever. Hence, the cherubim with their flaming whirling sword guarding the entrance so skillfully that even Indiana Jones wouldn't be able to get back in. So, as we have seen, Genesis 3 ends with an angel stopping people from getting back into the Garden of Eden to eat from the fruit of the Tree of Life, preventing them from making their lives even more miserable than what they would become because they now thought they knew what was best for them, not God. But before we can look at what is written at the beginning of Revelation 20, we do need some context. Remember, context is always important. And at the end of chapter 19, we read about this. There was this huge battle between God's angels against God's enemies, the beast, the false prophet, and the army of followers. The angels smash them. Their followers are killed. And the beast and the false prophet get thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Then immediately, we jump into chapter 20, where John says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a humongous chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him. Now, before you go, hang, hang on. I thought you said it was a mirror image. This is not exactly the same image that was at the end of Genesis 3. We were listening. The angel in Genesis had a dangerous flaming whirling sword. This angel, it only has keys and a humongous chain. Ah, yes. But remember, I also said inclusios mirror back the aim or purpose of the story's beginning by using similar images, ideas and words that were used in the introduction of the narrative. The image and the idea that is being repeated here is how there is an angel guarding the gate to paradise to prevent those kicked out from being able to come back in. So, just like the angel of Genesis 3, wielding his dangerous whirling flaming sword to prevent Adam and Eve from re-entering the garden, we see that Revelation's angel has a humongous chain and keys to lock up Satan and prevent him from entering into the new kingdom and deceiving the nations. Now stop and think for a moment about this key the angel is holding. This would not be a dime a dozen key, like the key to a small padlock or even a big lock. No, this key would be more secure than the key to Fort Knox. The picture Revelation is starting to give us is how the consequences dished out to Adam and his descendants are now being reversed. For now, we see an angel who is skillfully guarding the entrance to paradise to prevent Satan and his minions from entering paradise and ruining it with his half-truths, deceptions and outright lies like he did in the Garden of Eden and has been doing ever since. So from this picture, the one thing we can be confident about heaven is this, that Satan will not be able to enter heaven to play his mind games on anyone ever, ever again. Won't it be wonderful? No more confusion. No more worrying about who or what is right about God and his ways. From now on, in Revelation's last three chapters, we will see God reversing the curse that came from Adam and Eve disobeying God and throwing away God's right to rule and consequently their rights to rule with him. And I dare say, 
you are no different to everybody else that I know in that you want to be alive and see Christ return in all his glory. And who blames you? For I know I would love to see that. But unfortunately, Revelation 20 shows us that we have a high probability of dying and meeting Jesus before he returns to reclaim his kingdom on earth. For we read, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of proclaiming the word of God. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, a lot of people question, uh, just what does this thousand years mean? Is it a literal thousand years or an analogy? So as a quick aside question for those who query creation seven literal days and yet believe this means a literal 1,000 years. So why is it that you will accept this thousand year verse as being a literal time frame and you will not accept the clearly defined 24 hour time frame in Genesis? Whereas here in Revelation's context, it is strongly possible that the thousand years was used figuratively. For when you consider that the other three times the exact phrase thousand years is used elsewhere in the Bible, we see it being used as a metaphor for an ideal or even a limitless number. So in a sense, it could be like us Aussies saying, ah, it happened just the other day. And as we Aussies know, that could mean anything from a couple of days ago to, well, a lifetime ago. But really and truly, try to believe me, that it really doesn't matter whether you are alive or not when Jesus returns. For either way, it will feel like it has been in the blink of an eye. And we will be standing in the presence of God and his son Jesus in all his glory. Revelation 20 has this major reversal mirror thing happening where what went horribly wrong in Eden is flipped around and now instead of everything being all messed up and bad, it is perfectly good. Revelation 20 shows us that the Apostle Paul completely nailed it when he said, all things work together for the good of those who love God. Now most of us tend to think that verse means God turning our worries and troubles into good things here on earth right now. But I don't know about you, but from what we heard before, I certainly don't think it sounds like their experience on earth turned out to be good. Just listen again. I saw souls of those who had been beheaded. And while yes, I have, and possibly you have too, experienced where God turned a really bad situation into something good. But obviously that doesn't always happen. Just think. Actually, it's only back in 2015 when a video was released of 21 Christians being beheaded on a Libyan beach. And it's fairly safe to say that Paul would have witnessed far too many Christians being martyred. In fact, there were times he was almost martyred for Christ. So I reckon his focus may have been more on the not yet we will experience in heaven. Now in verse 4 of Revelation 20, we see God working it for good for those who love the Lord. So, for some context, do you remember how due to their sin, Adam and Eve lost their right to rule with God? Well, here in Revelation 24, we hear 
I saw seated on thrones those who were given authority to judge. What a beautiful picture of God making all things good by restoring the right to rule with him to those who image Christ, even to the point of death. And then we get another beautiful picture where Revelation reverses the Genesis scene where Adam and Eve stood before God in their flimsy, uncomfortable and scratchy fig leaf clothing which was their poor attempt to hide their nakedness. I reckon it is really fascinating how Revelation's account is vastly different and superior to what happened in Genesis. You see, instead of just two people standing before God, trembling in fear in their hastily put together fig leaf apron thing because of what they have done, wondering what their judgment will be. Revelation 20 gives us this picture of, oh well, the dead, the great, the small, are all standing before the throne waiting to be judged according to what they had done. Now, for us to get an idea of the extent of the number of people standing before the throne, we find the context comes earlier in Revelation where John describes seeing the Christians before God as a vast multitude from every nation, from every tribe, from every people and from every language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were robed in white and holding palm branches in their hands, praising God and the Lamb for their salvation. Oh, wow! Looks like there's going to be one humongous crowd standing before God and Jesus. And did you hear what they are robed in? Yes, white robes. And earlier, even still in Revelation, John had talked about seeing the crowd being given a white robe. Just think about it. They didn't have to throw together fig leaves to cover themselves. Now, we don't learn how they were given the robes, but I don't think the robes were just chucked at them with a, here, have these. Oh no, I get the sense it was more like an official ceremonial handing over of the robes. And I reckon these robes would be so soft and nice to wear. I imagine it would be even better than the soft and cosy feel of cashmere, combined with the light, silky feel of silk. Yes, Revelation gives us a picture of this total reversal from the embarrassment of standing before God in those terrible, itchy fig leaves to people standing before God in dignity and honour in white robes he had given them. And just think, the verse said there were so many Christians standing before God in their white robes that they couldn't be counted. Every single one of them feeling super comfortable and happy, standing before God, praising Him for what He has done. Have you ever seriously thought how that's literally everyone? who ever lived, standing before God, both Christians and non-believers. And crikey, that is an awful lot of people standing, waiting before the throne of God to be judged. To give you an idea of the number, in 2019, it was estimated that there were over 7.7 .7 billion people living in the world. And recent estimates using the evolutionary timeline, give the total number of people who have ever lived 
as being around 100 billion people. So I think we can safely say there will be a humongous crowd and regardless of colour or whether they were trillionaires, billionaires or popular cool people or poor and felt insignificant while they were alive, believers and unbelievers, every single one of them are now equal in death, standing before God, waiting to be judged according to their works. The other interesting fact is that they, we are told God is judging people according to their works twice in quick succession, like immediately in the following sentence. Hopefully, by now, we have learned that rep repetition of phrases means set up, take notice. This is important to know. Now, if this is that important that is repeated in two immediate sentences, then shouldn't this make us ask the question? What are these works that we need to be doing to ensure we will not be standing before God, feeling naked and fearful, like Adam and Eve did. As always, we need to look across all scripture for the context to see what God consistently says about what kind of works he is looking for from his people. Now, as Revelation is mirroring Genesis, here's a quick recap to remind us that Adam and Eve's work was to image God and how the serpent tempted Eve by homing in on her weak spot. And because she didn't really know God's word, her bad knowledge of God's word led to a badly warped faith in God, which then led to bad works. Her sin, where she no longer treasured God as rule of her heart, and despite God proving through his creation, that he certainly knows what is good for her, she wanted to decide what is good for her. And then across the Bible, we consistently see how God expects his people to follow him wholeheartedly. In the Old Testament, the Israelites asked the prophet Jeremiah, What have we done wrong? That God has judged against us, declaring we will experience disaster? And in God's answer, we see why they are being judged. Because they are unfaithful to God, abandon Him to worship and serve other gods. And what's even worse is that they are stubbornly following their own evil desires, refusing to listen to him and obey his word. And then in the Gospels, we read of Jesus telling the parable of the sheep and the goats, which I'm not going to explain as I'm assuming you know the parable. And if not, you can look it up. And how after separating the sheep, who had been imaging God by doing small acts of loving service from the goats, who had not done any such acts of loving service. Jesus then bluntly informs the goats, you need to realize that whenever you don't do anything for the drop kicks of the world, you're not doing anything for me. Away with you into eternal punishment, but the righteous will get eternal life. And sadly, the goat's problem stemmed from allowing Satan's lies to rule over them. And so their works consist of selfish, uncaring actions or seemingly caring actions motivated by pure self-interest. And God judged their works according to the wrong motivation from their heart. Whereas the sheep had Christ as Lord and ruling in their hearts, and they were sh sh faithfully showing the people around them by their works, Christ's grace and love. And that's what John sees. For those who had been beheaded for Jesus, and they did not worship the beast or his image, and they had not 
received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They hadn't listened to his lies. Okay, have you ever thought or asked this simple question? What is this mark Jesus is talking about? And just who could this Antichrist be? All right, maybe not so simple. Because a lot of people think it is literally the triple six number from early in Revelation, where John, after describing the beast, says, Understanding is needed to calculate the number of the beast. 666, six, six, which is the number of a man. Understanding what it means is easier said than done. For there are other scholars who think because seven is the biblical number for completeness, therefore six being one short of seven. And so the triple six is emphasizing that it can never ever be complete, which does make sense. But like a lot of things in the Bible, we need to remember that for the original readers, this triple six would have made perfect sense. But to us 21st century people, we don't have that same comprehension. And the same goes for understanding about the Antichrist. There have been a lot of theories about who this Antichrist is by looking at the numerical value of people's names. But we must remember that Revelation 13 and other verses tells us that there is far more to the Antichrist than having a name that adds to triple six. To me, Weasabee's viewpoint seems the most logical. And he says, the Antichrist number 666 represents the highest man can become apart from Christ. He is Satan's superman, his false Christ, Seven is the number of perfection, and this Satan cannot reach. Yet what is interesting is how all these super evil people who fit the bill as the Antichrist, like Nero, Hitler, etc., is that their names do work out numerically to triple six. And I reckon that could be because they are Satan's Antichrist for that particular time and place. But there is something that is far more important to look at than the triple six number when wondering who the Antichrist is. For what we need to consider is us in the here and now and how Jesus, when talking to what we would call good Christian people, and he's told them in no uncertain terms that they were deluding themselves because... They are like their father, the devil, who has not even one iota of truth in him. He is a liar, actually the father of liars. And you willingly carry out your father, the devil's desires, by not accepting and believing the truth found in Jesus' words. And don't we all know people who go to church and are nice and good but are not that crash high out of a person outside of church? Well, as the Apostle John points out, as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. And actually, many Antichrists have already come. And this is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us. If they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by their going, they showed that they didn't belong to us. And who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father can have the Son. And whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also 
will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. It appears we could have been looking for the Antichrist in all the wrong places. Think about all the aforementioned people who walked away from their faith and showed by their actions that they deny Christ's lordship over their lives. Therefore, in rejecting their faith, they are one of the many antichrists. And we cast our feeling, oh yeah, I've got it made. For the way those verses read, the antichrist could also be any Christian who, to avoid embarrassment or confrontation, lies by denying they believe Jesus is the Son of God, and that they are a Christian. Later in his letter, John calls out people who believe because they are God's people, they are all good with God no matter what, saying, you need to test the spirit within you. For if you cannot confess Jesus is the Christ who has come from God, then you have the spirit of the Antichrist. John is saying, come on, we can't rest on our being a Christian. We need to be constantly testing the spirit that is in our hearts, looking carefully to see which spirit we do have, because the Antichrist, may not be someone out there. Ouch! It could be our words and works making us the Antichrist. And that is what we will see from now on in chapters 20 to 22, how what we really need to be worrying about and focusing all our attention on is how are we living right here and now? Ah! We being fair dinkum witnesses for Jesus in our own daily lives. Well, actually, the whole Bible constantly hammers home that point. So we can be 100% positive that how we live our lives for Christ by imaging him and God is super important for our role in God's grand finale as he reverses the consequences. Amen. Uh,